On your knees. Okay, chop it off. Chop it off. Let's do it. Hello, internet people. I am John Francis Daly. And I'm Jonathan Goldstein. And we are the writers and directors of Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. We're super excited to be sharing our new trailer with you, and we're going to break it down right now. This film is about found family. Uh, despite our team's obvious differences, what keeps them together is this desire to fix something that's much bigger than themselves. And then what ultimately keeps them together is this newfound affinity that they end up having for one another. John and I really set out to make a movie that would capture the spirit of playing a game of D&D. &D. And we're not really using any existing story or characters with the exception of Zaz Tam, our big villain. This is pretty much all our own creation, but we're putting it in a world that comes from 50 years of the lore of Dungeons & Dragons. The monsters, the creatures, the magic, the locations, all of that you will see portrayed, but we're not trying to bog you down if you don't know anything about D&D &D, if you've never played it uh, as well. Um, first and foremost, we wanted this to be a big, fun adventure that felt a little bit different than the ones that you're used to seeing. Well, we begin in Neverwinter, which is one of the biggest cities in the Forgotten Realms in Dungeons and Dragons. That's Castle Never. And um, we wanted to create a, a city that felt real and vibrant, full of activity, um, but also, you know, a mix of grungy and beautiful. Uh, yeah, we really wanted a, to explore the multiple uh, eras that this city was built in. Like any old city that you see in Europe, uh, it feels lived in. It feels like it's got centuries of history behind it. And so it was really important to us to kind of find something that felt authentic, but also different from anything you've seen in, in our world. So this first scene really showcases the relationship between Holga, played by Michelle Rodriguez, and Edgen, played by Chris Pine. And while she's ready to take on, you know, 10 foes at once, Edgen really prefers to avoid getting his hands dirty. So it's, it's a fun dynamic that we get to see right off the bat. And a lot of these exterior scenes around Neverwinter we shot on our back lot in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, some of which was from the Game of Thrones um, King's Landing backlot. Now, if you remember, that series ended with a dragon destroying most of the city, so there wasn't that much left to work with, so we had to rebuild much of it. But it was fun to kind of be in their, uh, in, in their world and make it our own. We also get a glimpse here in this scene of um, Holga's brutally effective fighting style. It was important to us for the, the fighting throughout this whole movie to be portrayed in a way where you can actually see what's going on. So we tried to avoid quick cuts and long lenses. Uh, Jackie Chan's coverage of fighting was really the mandate when we approached all of these combat sequences. And we had this team of these grizzled Bulgarian stuntmen led by uh, Brad Martin, who is our second unit director and uh, stunt coordinator, who you can see really put their, their blood, sweat, and tears on camera here. So uh, Edgen and Holga have returned to Neverwinter to try to uh, reunite with uh, with someone, and they've basically been cast out, and orders have been given to execute them. And that's what's about to happen here. And you get a glimpse here of the loot that Edgen carries because he is a bard, and his main weapon is the loot, which uh, is an unlikely kind of weapon for a fantasy film, but it's a big part of uh, of D and D. And, uh, and you'll see throughout the movie, he gets to use it in very interesting ways. So here you see uh, this character of Sophina, who we know very little about, uh, holding a, uh, the mighty MacGuffin, um, which uh, we don't want to give too much information about here. But it, it comes into play very prominently in this film. And actually in this scene, in this one shot, there are actually a few uh, Easter eggs. Uh, in the background that if you were savvy to um, the world of D&D, &D, you might find interesting. So we get a glimpse there of uh, Zas Tam, who is um, the leader of Fae. He's a necromantic lich and not a nice guy. <laughs> but don't worry if you don't know what a necromantic lich is. It's not essential to your enjoying the film. That's actually my uh, instant messenger screen name. This character poses a huge potential threat to not only our characters, but the world that they live in. And it was, it was crucial 
to us that the stakes we introduce are not just big and world-threatening, but also incredibly personal. And we can't give too much away, but each of our characters are joining this heist for their own particular reasons. And we wanted those to be just as vital as the bigger picture threat. And Zas Tam uh, is someone that will be recognized by, by longtime players. He is a character who comes from the lore. He's one of the, uh, one of the few that we plucked from the, the game. He's super creepy and he's very powerful. Um, and there's a lot of kind of mystery about him. And while we, we only get glimpses of him here, what we kind of learn about him is that he's incredibly charming and charismatic and has a way with being able to quite kind of persuade his, his underling to do his bidding yeah, in, we, in a way we, that is, is sort of unique to the character. We portray him as a, a bit of a cult leader. This, this character that we see here is Zenk. Yendar, played by Reggae Jean Page. He's a, a paladin with this traumatic past. He's an adept fighter. He's incredibly serious and in many ways the antithesis of the rest of our group of thieves. He's got zero sense of humor and feels like he was plucked out of another fantasy film. That obviously creates a delicious rift between him and Chris Pine's character, who is equal parts threatened and baffled by him. We always find it funny when um, someone's taking things very seriously and has no sense of humor at all. This is Justice Smith playing a character, Simon, um, and he is a, uh, he's a sorcerer. And he comes from a long line of very famous and very successful wizards and sorcerers. And there's a lot of pressure on him to be good at what he does. And at the beginning of the movie, when we meet him, he is not exactly a great sorcerer. We wanted to kind of reflect the fun you get in playing and setting up your characters. You roll dice. Sometimes you get a high number, which means you're very good at something, but often you get a low number. Simon didn't get a great number, but he does level up over the movie. Simon has this thing called wild magic which uh, gives him this real unpredictability in the spells that he casts. So very often the spell he's trying to cast isn't the one that comes to fruition. And that is something that is in many ways uh, as, uh, synonymous with, with what he's dealing with himself. He has very little control over, over his power, but there is something deeply powerful within him that he needs to tap into. Fun fact about justice is that he's american and his english accent was so good that hugh grant thought he was british so this is this is sophia lillis playing doric who is our tiefling druid um we knew we needed a well-rounded out group and so each member of our ensemble have their own skills and, and setbacks um and so she she's really skilled at being able to change into different uh, animals. She's a, a wild shape. Um, and so it gives her this incredible, unique ability that uh, also allows her to slip into cracks and crevices and, and places that uh, normal sized people can't. So it's, it's something that we definitely showcase a lot throughout this film. Um, what she's going through there is a portal, though. <laughs> By the way, one of the more complicated shots in the film, some of it was done on the stage, some of it was done on location. It was a very involved bit of business. Yeah, what we built was a, a carriage that we couldn't fit our camera into, so what we did was we had both walls hinge out. And so when she goes through the, the floor there, we have the back wall out so that it can accommodate the camera. But then what you see is the camera does this 360 around her. And as we go around to the other wall, we're actually opening up that wall so the camera can fill in. And if you look very closely, you can actually see one of those walls just finishing closing at the end of that shot, just before we tilt down and see our game looking through the portal. So it was an incredibly complicated bit of uh, camera gymnastics, but it was really uh, gratifying when we were able to pull it off. So the orifice here is uh, one entrance to uh, the Underdark, which is a notorious um, cavernous world that exists in Dungeons and Dragons. And our team heads down there in search of this other magical item they need. Um, we built these massive sets to bring the Underdark to life. Our production designer, Ray Chan, was instrumental in conceiving what these places could look like. Notably, the area our characters are trying to get to is this hanging city of ruins that are suspended from these massive chain links. And so with between our incredible... Uh, 
uh, crew of, of uh, production uh, designers and artists, we were able to build this place and then extend it using uh, visual effects where we see these massive lava flows and this huge cavernous space. This is a good glimpse at the Neverwinter Arena, which is the, the Colosseum that sits in the city of Neverwinter just on the, on the Sword Coast. Uh, and it's where the High Sun Games took place long ago before Lord uh, Never Ember outlawed them. And these statues are actually two figures from the history of Neverwinter. Every every detail, we really tried to pay attention to things that super fans would recognize, but that wouldn't throw off people who don't care. So we, we wanted to um, have distinctive weapons for all our characters, things that, um, you know, could be memorable and unique to our movie. And uh, Holga's axe, about a third, two thirds of the way through the movie, lands in this molten steel and turns into a different weapon entirely. So this is where that's just happened. I think in all role playing games, upgrades and new weapons and collecting and looting is is essential. But I think in D&D, it li really gives you license to kind of push the envelope in terms of how unique and bizarre those weapons and items are. It's super badass, but this is one of the few things that isn't being lit by magic. We Ooh. do have a sword that Zank wields that he uses uh, his divine radiance to to uh, bring to life. Zank also has a pretty cool sword, which you see a glimpse of in this. It's called a dagger sword, and it has a dagger inside the main blade that he can use separately. So it's two, two killing weapons in one. So this is a, a battle our team has with Sofina, played by Daisy Head. This is in the main plaza in um, in Neverwinter, which is also Belfast. And um, that stone dragon up there, we actually built a version of it, and then it becomes a digital asset for this battle. But that said, I think we used a, we used a lot of the practical components of that dragon as well. Real real explosion. Bill, we, um, well, well, I mean, through through the magic of, of trailers, uh, we're seeing actually multiple moments in this film portrayed as as one. So that first spell where she's summoning these these meteors then becomes what what uh, another spell that she does that animates this this dragon to life and one that they have to contend with now. It was very important to to me and John to incorporate practical effects into this, meaning things that were actually there on set and built prosthetics and monsters. Um, we didn't want to just rely on green screens and VFX. That said, the geniuses at ILM brought this dragon to life in a way that no one else could. And we even played with the sort of animation styles that it could have. We tried this Harryhausen kind of stop motion effect on it that ended up being kind of jarring in uh, the real world, but uh, was just one example of the many kind of trial and error uh, experiments that we did throughout devising all of these characters and creatures. Again, that was the part where we kind of mashed up moments in the movie uh, to to accommodate the trailer in a fun, dynamic way. Yeah, there's a lot. We worked really hard to create a sense of scope and size to this movie. Places, you know, we shot in Iceland. We shot all over Northern Ireland. There's some stuff from France. It, it, we shot a live, active volcano that was erupting, and that was that was probably one of the first times that's been done in cinema history. So that was exciting. So here we have Hugh Grant, who is a delightful, delightful performer that we enjoyed working with immensely. Um, he plays a rogue, uh, Forge Fitzwilliam, who uh, is on board with our game when they're first uh, band of thieves and then um, has plans of his own, but I won't get into it much more than that. And this isn't this isn't the kind of movie that um, you typically expect to see Hugh Grant in, which is why it was so exciting to get him. I mean, we wrote the part for him and he read the script and he loved it and and came aboard, which was a real vote of confidence for us. It was flattered. a real coup for sure. And when we first met with him and after he had read the script, he said, which one of you is British? And we said, neither. He said, because it has a real British sensibility. It was, it was a nice thing to hear. 
you, you don't want anything other than to be told that you seem British. He is, uh, he, if, if he were to be classed in a game, he would be definitely a rogue. He's cunning and uh, conniving and clever and slightly evil, but also there is a real charm to him, I think, that makes you keep coming back for more. Well, here we have this maze that we devised uh, that sits within the um, Neverwinter Arena where uh, our characters are forced to navigate it. And what was fun about this is that it is very much an allusion to the grid style uh, format of many um, dungeons that people play through when they're when they're in a campaign. Well, John and I were both players of D&D over the years. Uh, you know, I did it when I was younger. John has played more recently. A labyrinth is the sort of thing you encounter quite a bit in campaigns. And we wanted to find a fun way to put our characters into a deadly maze situation. And that's absolutely this is this is one of our versions of a dungeon, basically, because we have multiple dungeon crawls within this film. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's something that's underground and bleak. So well, there you got the gelatinous cube and the displacer beast. And they are jumping into a gelatinous cube to escape a displacer beast. And many would say, that's a bad idea. You sustain more damage from within a gelatinous cube than you would from being attacked by a displacer beast. But don't you worry. We thought about a lot of this. And uh, they've got a plan. Here we are back in the Underdark where Zank is facing down uh, Dralis, who's an assassin sent to kill him and our other teammates. And this is a great example of some, some of Ray Chan's design work, our production designer. You see these uh, terracotta gnomes that are evocative of those in China with the terracotta soldiers. We also have two very unique weapons that they're each wielding. Zank's is illuminated by divine radiance, and that was the previously mentioned dagger sword that detaches so that he can fight multiple foes at the same time. And we also see Dralis wielding this uh, green flame blade, which if you are quite familiar with the game and spells, you might know what that is as well. Reggie Jean Page deserves a lot of credit because he really got into the sword play and, uh, and learned these moves. It's not easy to do all this, and we did long takes, so it was a multiple series of, of fight mechanics that he had to master in order to, to do these. He yeah, he was, job. he was dripping with sweat a, after each take because it was it was probably the most physically taxing thing that anyone has ever asked him to do. He did weeks and weeks of of training in getting this sword fighting right. So and and is naturally athletic because you can tell he he, he really knows what he's doing, and we were so impressed. And, and he had to do it with with the you know thirty pounds of armor on. Here we have uh, a mimic, which is another very popular uh, monster in the game of D&D, and one that is so unique in the fantasy world to D&D, you are not going to see this in any other fantasy film. And we just love how both treacherous and absurd it is. Fun thing about that sequence was the tongue was a real uh, prosthetic that was on on set, and the rest of the, uh, the mimic inside was digital effect. But we wanted to be able to really wrap something around Michelle's leg so she could fight it off. Okay, well, here we have uh, the Owlbear, which is another iconic monster in Dungeons and & Dragons. And uh, it is actually Doric, uh, wild shaping into one as, as in, from her Drew itself. And uh, it was really exciting to see this thing come to life. We went through so many iterations uh, because, you know, these owlbears, when you're, you're looking at an illustration in a, in a D&D book, you can get away with a lot in terms of the angles and, and how it lumbers and how it looks. But when you're actually seeing it in a, in a three-dimensional space, it changes how you perceive what it should look like in the, in the sort of most uh, aesthetically pleasing but also formidable kind of uh, creature that you can make. We're aware that there was a certain amount of controversy that emerged in the D&D fan community after the first trailer showed our druid wild shaping into an owlbear. And it was something we discussed a great deal when we were writing it. Uh, we know that technically it's not uh, permissible, but we subscribe to the rule of cool. And we felt that if we, as the dungeon masters of this movie, would let our players do this, then 
why should we deprive the audience of something that's as cool and fun as this? So obviously, Edgen is alluding here to losing everything that ever mattered to him. And we, we're seeing him in simpler, quieter times with his family. So you can imagine what might have been lost. But I won't give too much away beyond that. As, as you know, there are multiple planes that you can visit within the game of Dungeons & Dragons. So we thought this would be a really fun one to portray. Um, and without giving anything else away... What D&D gave us license to do is really warp our perception of reality and, and what is real. And any one plane is no less real than the other, but it does look, you know, bizarre to uh, our, our human eyes. One of my favorite Hugh Grant line readings, you know, it's just so dry, so British, um, quintessentially sort of um, Monty Python-esque in a way. And just to get into the technical nitty gritty, what we see Edgen suspended by here are black tentacles, which were uh, practical. And one of the many creatures uh, and monsters created by our crack team at Legacy Effects, who also gave you Baby Yoda. So here we've got two different spells, uh, Sophina wielding Mage Hand, uh, fighting down Simon's uh, Earthen Hand, uh, which is another very unique to D&D, something that we knew we wanted to see on film because of how different it is and, and how we don't get to play with this this kind of an arm wrestle in the fantasy space. It's a spectral floating hand. Yeah, we, ju we wanted it to be evocative of her kind of color scheme, but also horrific. And, you know, it's kind of like a meat hand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think every... Uh, wizard's mage hand would probably look different and be specific to them and their personality and their aesthetic. And so this, because she is uh, necromantic, this felt like a, a good fit. Yeah, we get a very brief glimpse of Sophina in an altered state, but we don't want to get too much into it. But uh, there's, there's more than meets the eye to this character, for sure. Yeah, this is a, a moment when our team finally gels as a team, really coming together using all of their skills against the villain. And that's a great moment in any D&D campaign where the strengths of each character is brought to bear. We also wanted to showcase it in a fun kind of roundy round one that is quintessentially turn-based if you look at each of their actions. And this is... Uh, Thembershod, our version of Thembershod, who is a dragon that exists in the lore. In our version, as you can see, he's gotten a little chunky. Thembershod in the lore is, is known as being a, a glutton. And so we really wanted to lean into that idea for, for one of our dragons. We wanted each of our dragons to be special in their own right because People know what dragons look like. They've seen a lot of them in the fantasy world. And so we wanted to put our own kind of unique flavor in that. And in some ways, this dragon sequence is a good example of the tone that we tried to balance through the whole movie, which is never undermining what's at stake. People's lives are at risk and people die. But you're also hopefully laughing a lot of the time. And that was the tightrope that we walked. That's right. I mean, since this is a film based on a very unique role-playing game, it was imperative that we feel like like we're in one. And one of the best parts of D&D &D is, you know, how you can put your own kind of original spin on the creatures that you thought that you were familiar with. This is another brilliant creation of Ray Chan, our production designer, who helped us build this hill of bones that we find out in a moment that Thembershod created. So they, they're all of his his leavings, basically, that our, our characters have run up and suddenly come up upon Thembershod. Something also that was, that was um, just a little tidbit was uh, a lot of the filler for these bones. While we have thousands of bones here and molds of bones, uh, we also needed to kind of fill what was underneath them. And so what they used were these ground up seashells that by day three in this tech tent where we were shooting smelled absolutely heinous. It couldn't have smelled worse. It was like being in a fish market that had been sitting for weeks. So this is uh, this is our hanging city of Doblin, you can see, and this bridge 
that they need to get across, which Simon quickly uh, triggers the uh, the destruction mechanism. And it's the kind of joke we love. In the actual film, as you see, there's a much longer lead up to the explosion. Um, it forces them to solve this problem in a new way. It's also very special to playing any good campaign of D&D where you're having to constantly pivot when plans go awry. So in this last bit, we wanted to show how even the most well-laid plan can implode from a single misstep or bad roll of the die. I mean, the, the other thing that's so special to the game as it sits in the fantasy space is that is that it has a sense of humor. The most fun and engaging campaigns are the ones where we're laughing in one moment and crying in the next. And we had to showcase that emotional fluidity, even in the trailer. That's right. I said emotional fluidity. The, the humor here is we're, we're never taking the piss out of the circumstances that our characters are in. But like most human beings and, you know, I guess in this case, half elves and teeth links we often find funny in the tragic it's what keeps us from going insane and and reggae jean page has a priceless glare in this moment we're super excited to share this with the world we've spent the last two and a half three years creating this and we're really excited and proud of it and uh can't wait to, to share it with everybody. Yeah, this was very much a labor of love for us as being huge fans of D&D, but also fans of these big movies that can bring people together in a way that nothing else really can. We're just so excited to unleash it to you and hopefully uh, we'll see you at the movies. And that's the end of the breakdown. John and I really appreciate you taking the time to look and uh, hope you enjoy the movie.